Game and Flames does Spear and Seer, Kai learns from some of the best Spearos in the country as he starts hunting beneath the waves. So much fun. It's all very southwest this week. Ollie Williams and I head out to beautiful Dartmoor after Robux. Plus, listen up, we'd like a word in your shell like we have the results of the Ear Defender survey, which brands are making the most noise. And the antibiotic colours are being even more mad than usual. News editor Ben O'Rourke explains what they're up to. We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Why restrict your hunting to land when there's sea to explore? <laughs> We're in Cornwall with game cook Kai at Bryn. For years, the Welsh Game and Flames wizard has felt he's scratching the surface when it comes to free, fresh, sustainable wild food. Is it quite flattering? So he's finally embarking on a deep learning curve under the watchful eye of some of the best spear fishermen or spearos in the country. It's going to probably take us an hour or two. Just to get comfortable and kind of yeah, yeah, find yeah, out where we're at. Yeah, where, where you are. And then after that, we, we will move to a spot where we're going to start hunting. OK. When people go rifle shooting, they get buck fever. OK, yeah. Do spearos get... Ah uh, yeah, the, all the beginners. You, a, you will see Kai, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Two hands on the on the spear gun. <sighs> but yeah, no, hey, it, 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 it's, it's normal. You know, you get excited. Oh, I'm going to get this one. And now you're going to miss it. Then it gets printed in your head and then the next one you're going to be, okay. <laughs> I'm focusing now. Maxime Blondel, known as the Frenchman, is at the top of his game. He's going to be teaching Kai the ropes. Matt Coombe is the local boy and has arranged the whole thing. You're going out and collecting your own food, what could be better? You know exactly where the food's come from that you're putting on the table for your, your kids and your family and your neighbours, and you've put in the hard work to get them. Matt shoots too, so the plan is to try and bag a buck as well as a bass. Many of the guys we meet shoot rifles, shotguns and spear guns. In return, Kai is going to do what he does best, take the catch of the day from half a dozen local Spearos and cook up a feast. Spear and Seer. The weather couldn't be better. The boat launches from Foy and Kai will be in the water for the next few hours holding his breath. We have, we've got today's a bit of a crash course to be honest with you, there's probably so much to learn but if we get all the basics and kind of the important stuff out of the way then when I go home then I can continue learning off Seaford um, in East Sussex. But um, we've got this today then tomorrow there's a big group of us going out and then it's going to be a, a barbecue tomorrow evening so Hope more than just pebbles and yeah, I think you know it's going to be a lot of bass around. Hopefully, some pollock, maybe some wrasse. Um, we'll probably see a lot of life. So yeah, I'm really excited. Uh, I said the weather's good, and um, yeah, I think we're just waiting now to get in there. So give us a fish call. <laughs> Apparently, you've got to do the. <clears throat> I don't know if that works. He's trying to make me look stupid. I don't know, but we'll find out. But you're laughing, so it's. <laughs> Looks like you've eaten one of your burgers. <laughs> No oh, thanks. <laughs> it's not it's not burgers anymore. We're higher oh, right. end. Yeah, higher end than that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are perfect. 
flat calm with visibility of 7 metres, which is about the depth we've anchored in. For experienced Spiros, it's the equivalent of the shallow end. Some of these guys dive to 30 or even 40 metres to hunt fish. Maxime covers safety and kit first. So, burpee sets, the function of make you just pee outside of your wetsuit. What the advantage of that is you avoiding any skin and ear infection. Well, you're not raising the risk, it's just because when you pee in your wetsuit, the, the pee doesn't stay only in the pants, it goes all the way up and down. Yes. So you can have rash everywhere on your legs, you can have ear infections, skin, skin infection in general. So that's the first thing. Second thing. Can I see it? I didn't actually see it. Where is it? Ah. Oh. It's just like an extra piece of neoprene sticking out of your pants, <laughs> of your bottom of the... Did the French have special sizes? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Once Kai is diving efficiently, he is introduced to the gun. If you try to load your, your gun into steps, it's not going to work. But if you do it in the motion, so I'm going to push that, squeeze my scapula, and then in the same time, bend. Yeah, well, I'm already on the first hook. So I'm not loading any guns outside of the water. Okay, it's, well, first it's forbidden, but also it's not safe. So much of what Kai learns is about efficiency. Moving an arm, holding kelp, all burn oxygen, reducing bottom time, and in many cases, that's the key to a successful outing. A thing people need to put in their, in their mind, the breath hold is not what is important, is uh, what is around the, the, the breath hold. We go from the surface with uh, uh, that that's tank of oxygen, and then we go down, it's still the same, so you, you don't want to burn it doing movement you don't want. The, the general public, after probably a day with, uh, with an instructor, they probably reach the one minute, one minute and a half on the static breath hold, or even probably longer for some people. They can reach the one minute, but uh, is the condition in which they, they reach that one minute. This is Nick Collins, one of the most experienced Spiros in the country. He uses his field craft and impressive breath holding ability to stalk or lie in wait for fish. What surprised me, because most of my filming is done of, of hunting birds or whether it's you know, deer or yeah. whatever it may be, the similarities and crossover, do you see that yourself? Yeah. Yeah, well, I do hunting as well. You know, I was you? brought up with dogs and ferrets, and I even hunted a pack of herrings once, a gun pack. So, yeah, I see the similarity, especially from somebody who hunts that goes to spearfishing. You have that knowledge from hunting that you can take in the water, and it makes a difference, you know, to stalk up on a fish. A lot of them's got different ways of hunting fish. Some will sit on the bottom and wait I like to stalk around and yeah I like to find my fish and yeah. surprise them yeah. so yeah it is a big it's very similar if you've if you've got a good hunting background then going into the spearfishing it's quite easy to do yeah. if you're comfortable in the water that is according to the British Spearfishing Association there are around 4,000 Spearows in the UK and interest is on the up it only costs £12.50 a year for beginners to join the governing body, which wants to be in a strong position to advise, educate and campaign as the popularity of the sport grows. We could do with a lot more people joining us because it's expanding so quickly, it's becoming so widespread. So for argument's sake, a lot of our members would be down on the south coast of the UK. We may not know about legislation that's due in around Scotland way. Because we're voluntary as well, we can only dedicate a certain amount of time. So we still want to be involved with that, we still want to be able to help and represent those people because it's nice when you've got one big voice instead of lots of small voices throughout the country all fighting for the same thing. The majority of Spiros are one for the pot guys and there are restrictions on species such as bass, lobster and scallops. 
The UK season is short because many of the targeted fish species move to deeper waters during the winter, so there's a natural rest period. Unlike the med, where the fish can be spear shy. Basically, the fish adapted. He adapted very, very well. He knows what a spear gun is, so when he see one, he kind of run away. Here in the UK, I find that for me is like an aquarium. You know, there's fish everywhere. You take what you need more than what you find, and uh, but in the med is is more. You struggle, you struggle, you struggle, and one day maybe you're going to pick up the the right day. Back to the boat, and Kai is now hunting. Hey! <laughs> oh. Nice size one. Oh, Very lovely. nice size one. Yeah. <laughs> so as you can see, the tail is complete. So there is no notch. Sometimes they got a notch. It's the one they used to do the study and stuff like that. You have to put it back. Okay. Okay. Uh, it would be the measurement is from here to the base of the of the eyes there. So it's over the 86 millimeters. Yeah. So we can keep it. Oh yes, fantastic. And, and, and also, that's the female. You can recognize it because the large, like a dandelion dandel okay. stuff there, to hold the eggs. But she's not with eggs, so we can keep it. Oh, fantastic. That's a beauty. <laughs> oh. Nice, nice for the barbecue for tonight. Yes, mate. <laughs> oh. <laughs> To make sure we have enough fresh fish for our spear and sear party, Maxime dives down to a wreck at about 20 metres. Now, as you watch these pollocks swim by, don't forget, he's holding his breath. Beauty. Look at that pollock. Nice shot placement too. <laughs> Kai finishes the day with two ras and a bass. And whatever you do, don't call it a sea bass. Okay. Yeah. How are you feeling about this? Yeah, pretty good actually. I think my ears took a bit of a pounding, but I'm still getting used to it. So we've got um, one lobster, uh, two wrasse and a bass. So bass is 42 centimetres, which is the legal limit. Um, so pleased with that. Um, so I think we will eat well and I'm looking forward to try the wrasse. Some people think it's not great, but oh, there's a lot of other people think they are great. So I'm going to make up my own mind and so are you, David and everyone else is gonna eat with us. <laughs> We've got no choice. Um, so yeah, all in all, a really good day. Very pleased. The following morning, we get up early for a roebuck guided by Matt. 
He's a passionate hunter, and it doesn't matter whether it's land-based or sea-based, it's still the hunt that gets him putting on a wetsuit or a wet weather jacket. Just like with hunting, there's a huge amount of effort that goes in behind the scenes before you can pull the fish. Well, you saw it today. I mean, we've been out today, we didn't get a fish, but it was amazing to be out there. But how long were we out there? Four hours? Didn't see a single fish, a lot of swimming, a lot of drinking salt water. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's still better than being at work all day, isn't it? What is it though? What is it about spearfishing? Would you rather, okay, if you had one last hunt, mm. would it be spearfishing or would it be with a rifle? It'd be spearfishing. <laughs> I love my rifle, I love, I love stalking deer, but you can't beat dropping down into the weed, lying there, making a few grunts, squeaking the band, and having a fish come in, and then you get that moment where you think, oh no, that's huge, I'm definitely going to miss. And then you hit it. <laughs> Or you miss completely. Now you use but, the terminology then that people, a lot of people will not understand. Squeaking your band. So, <laughs> so let's, let's talk about the calling because I did video you doing a bit of that today. So yeah. you call in fish. Yeah, so everyone does it a bit differently. Max will do it differently to me. So Max does a grunt. He'll have to show you his grunt. No, go on. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I, I tend to do it with my bands. So when the spear gun is loaded, obviously these are under tension. We're not going to load it out of the water now. So what I tend to do is the band would be tight here and I've, I have no fingers on my gloves, I took the fingers off and I just just give it two little squeaks on the rubber and if, if a bass is turning away from you, it gives you that little second, it will turn to see what it is and it will come back around, sometimes, not today. Yeah, but you got reactions today, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we had a few reactions today, but... Um, but you also play with sand and you do other things Yeah, too. Yeah, absolutely. You can, you can lie on the bottom. Sometimes you can flick the sand a little bit. If they're, in, if they're moving around you and you want to get them in a bit closer, you can flick a little bit of sand. I know they do that quite a lot, say in Australia and places like that. Um, I've also taken a limpet shell, rubber limpet shell on the rocks. That tends to, tends to wake them up a little bit. With the bass, mullet will just carry on doing their own thing. They're not interested in that as much. Another similarity you know, you spot is the, the fact that you, you were wearing a camo camouflage mm -hmm. wetsuit today. You're always going to have a shadow. You're always going to be a, um, an object in the sea that fish are going to be wary of. But if you drop down into the kelp or into a gully, the, the camo is going to break you up that little bit extra and you're not a lump on the floor anymore. And how do you think Kai's done over the last couple of days? <laughs> he's done really well. I think he's uh, having a few ear issues, but. I mean, to get out with Max was brilliant. Uh, Max is somebody that I would look up to as a as a diver, and to get him get first bass and his lobster and his wrasse, and yeah, he's he's, well, he's still smiling now. Matt has enrolled spear fishermen from across Cornwall to deliver some prime fresh fish, and they don't disappoint. Maxime has been out on the rib, and oh la la, look at the size of that. Up on the hill, Kai is prepping dips, salads, and of course, the catch of the day. So what are you going to do with the bass? So we're going to do the bass two ways. So we're going to do it uh, just pan fried really, really hot with some salt. And then we're going to actually do a bit of a tandoori paste and yogurt with it as well. We've got pollock. We're going to just put that in some uh, seasoned Cajun flour, fry that off with some uh, pineapple and mango salsa uh, with a bit of chili and some guacamole and some homemade flatbreads as well. So. I hope you're hungry, David. Spirits are high, everybody's smiling, and it's our last night here, so um, yeah. cheers. Honestly, I, I took also I took joining us this evening is another well-known yeah, Spiro, YouTuber Joe PK. When I started making videos, you know, there wasn't much information out there. There were very, well, barely anyone in this country making videos spearfishing in the UK. There are lots of Mediterranean uh, divers out there doing it, and yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, show people this is what you can access with a, a mask and snorkel and some fins. You know, this is what you can do. It seems a really lovely but small community at the moment. Are you sort of worried that it will lose that sort of sense of family as, as it grows? Because I, I get a feeling that it might well grow because there seems to be an awful yeah. lot of interest. I think actually, no, I think on the contrary, you know, growth will be really, really great for the hobby. I think also in the UK, you know, six months of a year, it's super tough, poor visibility, rough water. It's super cold, you know, eight, nine, 10 degrees around February, March. So the sea gets a big rest for a lot of the time. We get a rest from each other. And then, you know, when the season's on, it's great. It's community feel, making the most of the weather when it's lovely. And yeah, I think the more people that do it, the more knowledge there will be, the more forums, you know, exchanging 
ideas and knowledge, so it'd be great. Because you know hunters can be a bit elbows out. Very much so. It's the, it's the predator, isn't yeah. it? It's like, it's not the herd instinct, it's the yeah. predator instinct. Yeah. You know, this is my patch, keep away. <laughs> is there a sense of that at all? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Mass massively, massively. You know, 90% of the fun is actually discovering for yourself where the spots are. I think if you just say, you know, you can catch this here, but you're not going to learn. It's, you're not going to have as much fun. It's been an eventful and fulfilling few days with this Cornish crew. Kai has learned boatloads, and I wouldn't want to be a bass pollock or a mullet off the south coast for the next few weeks. There's a new Spiro in town. So much fun. Thank you to everyone who helped with that film. And if you want to hear more from the guys, we have produced a podcast featuring all of their extended interviews, plus on our Field Test YouTube channel, Laith Dajani from Spearfishing UK explains what kit you need to get you started. Right, he may not have big lungs, but he does have webbed toes. It's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Hunsabs from North Wales have complained of a shooter running one of them over. A couple of dozen sabs descended on Walshaw Estate in West Yorkshire on the 12th of August 2020, ending an opening day driven grouse shoot mid-morning. After shooters left, police turned up and sabs claimed that this angry shooter returned in his car. Sabs allege he drove into one of them, knocking him to the ground and running over another Sab's belongings. According to the group's Facebook post, police asked the driver to do a breathalyzer test, but didn't take any action, leaving the Sabs disappointed. Don't get fussed about wildlife crime. That's the message to the Scottish Government from the Scottish Gamekeepers Association. It says that recent reports about raptor killings may be tragic, but they lack perspective and outcries on social media are fuelled by unhealthy doses of misinformation. SGA Chairman Alex Hogg says the comments are becoming increasingly extreme as animal rights groups try to influence Scottish politics. Environment Secretary Rosanna Cunningham is calling for a crackdown on wildlife crime and a review of grouse moors after a white-tailed eagle was found dead in Aberdeenshire. SGA points out that wildlife crime has reduced dramatically over the past decade and incidents are now rare. Meanwhile, Basque marked the opening of the grouse season by taking adverts in several regional newspapers in the north of England and in Scotland to explain the benefits of grouse shooting. The Scottish Gamekeepers Association is also in the news for slamming a report on trapping. The League Against Cruel Sports is drumming up support for a petition by Scottish anti-hunting group One Kind, which calls for a review into the use of traps and snares. The SGA points out the paper was not peer-reviewed and is riddled with estimates and inaccuracies. It's written by anti-hunting academic Stephen Harris, who was called out by fellow academics for misrepresenting science while at Bristol University. The price of venison has been a hot topic recently with prices plummeting. The Deer Society is holding a webinar this Wednesday night, the 19th of August 2020, live on its YouTube channel. Before lockdown, the price of venison was already under pressure, said to be due to large culls in Europe. After lockdown, prices have dropped below one pound a kilo. The webinar's guests include game dealers and deer managers. This year's Northern Ireland's Game Fair has fallen foul of coronavirus. But like other events, organisers have taken it online to create the virtual Game Fair. The virtualgamefair.com opens its doors on the 29th of August and will run for the rest of this year and all of next. It promises an exciting mix of exhibitors, competitions and bargains galore, which will be accessible by people all over the world. Field Sports Channel has a virtual stand. So far, it has been very successful in terms of exhibitor engagement and interest from the market that we already work with. Uh, so we feel that it, this is going to be an ongoing project, which will be another arm to the overall brand. The Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust has a new book out called Farming with Nature. The book is set to inspire farmers and policymakers with its practical advice about how conservation efforts aimed at the grey partridge can benefit farmland biodiversity. The grey partridge is one of the fastest declining farmland birds in Europe 
plunging 90% since the 1970s. Its presence is an indicator of the health of a farm's ecosystem. The book is £12 and can be ordered from the GWCT's website. Link is in the description below. A British bow hunter has started a petition to bring bow hunting back. Kayla McGrady lives in Australia, where he's starring in a reality survival show, Outback Lockdown, with his girlfriend, Kai Ferno. The petition is in its early stages and still needs government approval to go ahead. There's a link to it below. It's not the first petition to bring bow hunting back to the UK. A petition four years ago ended with only 26 people signing it. Around half of European countries allow bow hunting, with Denmark recently easing restrictions. Use of a bow and arrow to harvest game is alive in such countries as France, Germany, Italy, Hungary, Spain, Bulgaria, Canada, America, Australia. So why is it illegal in the UK? A country whose rich heritage of use of the bow and arrow dates back as early as the earliest recorded use of a bow some 5,000 years ago. A Swedish anti-hunting group has been forced to close down because of the lack of members. In a final Facebook post, its admin admitted they were the only person left, as its members had gone and no new paying members had signed up. They said they'd been the only member since the spring. Staying with wolves and the number of farm animals killed by them in a part of Germany has doubled. 2019 was a record year for animals killed by wolves in mecklenburg vorpommern state, but 2020's total for January to August is twice it was for the same period. The German Ministry for Agriculture said 227 sheep, goats, calves or other animals have been killed or injured. This is more than the whole of 2019 in which 205 sheep, cattle, goats, wildlife and other farm animals were killed or injured by wolves. The Ministry of the Environment came under fire recently for killing a wolf that it claimed was trying to mate with a dog. Thanks to Per Holmseth for the story. Rangers have killed a bear in Canada after it's lost its fear of humans. Conservation officers moved in to kill Hucklebury, as he was called, after reports that locals in Vancouver's North Shore district deliberately allowed him to feed from their bins while they videoed it. The North Shore Black Bear Society says humans are to blame for not shooing the animal away. The Conservation Service says bears that are conditioned to eat human food must be put down because non-lethal solutions usually don't change their behaviour. Kenya's 50-year animal rights experiment is now even angering park rangers and conservationists. With wildlife worth almost nothing, a plan to fence Nairobi's National Park is, they say, the latest in a long-term plan to turn the country into a zoo. Some species have recorded a 70% decline in the last 40 years. The government blames that on human activity and invasive species. Maasai tribal leaders are threatening street protests if the fence is built. And finally, fancy a hug? Maybe not, but there's a free holiday in it. Finland's Halipu Forest in Lapland is offering a week's free accommodation for the winner of the first Tree Hugging World Championships. The event is going to be held in the forest, but it's going online instead, so you can enter from anywhere. Deadline is the 29th of August, 2020. All you need to do is take a photo of you hugging your favorite tree and send it along with the coordinates of the tree and a short explanation about why you think the tree is special. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. And there is more news on our website, link in the description below, or simply pop over to F channel slash news. Coming up, I'm out with deer stalker Ollie Williams. First, a little information about a night vision rifle scope. Thanks, Pulsar. Now, do you have protection? Is it comfortable? Is it sensitive? Ultimately, will it stop you paying for it later? 
Hearing protection. What? Yes. What do you wear on or in your ears? Well, listen up. Out of the 3,500 of you who responded to our lockdown kit survey in the spring, 435 completed the survey on hearing protection. It's something we have been pushing on Field Sports Channel, especially with Roy Lupton going so deaf. And you rightly pick us up when we show people shooting without hearing protection. So what do you, the Field Sports Channel viewers, wear? Well, there are a couple of clear winners. One of them is headphones, which are still significantly more popular than in-ear protection. They may make you look like Teletubbies when you are out shooting, but the great majority of shooters use cans these days. And there is a headphone make that is a long way ahead of the competition. More on that later. First, let's look at some of the areas where you praise your plugs. For comfort, you prefer Sens over all other manufacturers. The in-ear solution and maker of the popular ProFlex, which is the biggest selling in-ear hearing protection among Field Sports Channel viewers. How well does your hearing protection work? Here, the winner is the range from MSA Swordin. Hearing protection is expensive, so which company offers the best value for money, in the opinion of our viewers? They choose the orange crinkly earplugs from Sonic. And customer service for those who have had to send back their hearing protection and get them fixed. The winner is UK mail order company and distributor Napier, maker of the Pro 9 and Pro 10 headsets. Now the big winners. In the in-ear category, Sens dominates with 8% of the total market. Its biggest seller, the ProFlex, is, however, outsold by... In third place, the MSA Swordin Supreme Pro X. And in second place, the Honeywell Howard Light Impact Sport. First place, by several lengths, goes to the 3M Peltor Sport Tag. With 3M Peltor owning 36% of the entire Field Sports Channel viewer market. Well done, those Swedes. Once again, we hope that is of use to you and your buying decisions, which is what our new show, Field Tester, is designed to do. If you missed it, episode one covers off-the-shelf copper rounds for rifles, how to buy the right boots, and our gun shop gurus give you their advice on bargain clay guns, and what happens when your gun goes bang, but in a bad way. Follow the link on the screen. Now, Ollie Williams and I meet a man with a limp. A limp what? Let's find out. Striding out over land on the edge of Dartmoor, you wouldn't think that deer stalker Tom Davis recently lost a toe. Last year, March, I had a uh, accident of standing on a nail, um, and during last summer, I actually spent five months laid up, having three operations. One of them actually losing a bit of bone and uh, a toe. And uh, only just recently, I got a surprise phone call um, saying I needed to go back in for another operation for my foot, um, which wasn't good. It was only ten days before the fallow and red season started, so it's, you know, it's knocked me back a bit, but. Today is the day of first putting the boot back on again. We're in. <laughs> it feels good actually, yeah. although very tight because my foot's swollen. <laughs> but yeah, it feels good. So my advice, don't stand on nails. <laughs> they make them tough out here on the moor and they make them confident. Tom has asked Ollie Williams to help him with an agricultural pest problem. <laughs> he explains to Ollie what he reckons we will see. We were out going, looking to cull some um, red stags. Uh, this particular valley, we've got red stags coming in and um, they do crop damage every year. Um, it's always an issue as the stags summer there in their bachelor herds. Um, so our main target today is some coal stags. Every year they come in on the, on the crop. There's maize there at the moment um, and they're coming out and actually grazing on the wheat. Um, but it's not just the grazing they do, they also lay down in there. I mean, there's one there, it's been there this year's sixth year being that valley. Um, and he's, you know, he's a very nice stag and uh, yeah, he's still got a few years left in him yet, so which is good. Hopefully you might see him this evening. Recently we've had a, a unicorn roebuck been passing through, um, which is, you know, hopefully if he's there tonight, I don't really want him there because um, there are some nicer roebucks there. Um, so if the chance comes later, we'll, um, yeah, we'll look at taking that one as well. Um, but our, you know, our main target is the red because they are the ones causing the main damage really. It's got, it's got to be a be an imperial stag, or you know, we're going home. You know, no, but I'm excited to cull, to cull some, uh, some problem animals today because that's why we're here. 
you know, there's there's some there's some stags which are doing damage to damage to the crops, and at the end of the day, deer management is about managing the deer, not just shooting for the best heads. It's early season for reds. They're still in velvet, but as Ollie says, this is a management cull. It's also a meat operation. Tom runs a venison box delivery service, which you can sign up to online. And it's intriguing for Ollie because Dartmoor may only be in the next door county, but it is surprisingly different to his home patch in Cornwall. Well, Dartmoor just you know, when you when you think Dartmoor, you think big, big stags, big you know, um, big deer populations, and, and big, huge areas, which you just don't really get in Cornwall. It really is big country. big country for big animals and Tom has been watching this crop closely in recent weeks. As a result he's confident we will see multiple reds tonight. And then the other evening when I come up with a the thermal there was one, a uh, three just here. Similar time, of, similar time of day? Yeah, 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 in between half past eight and yeah. quarter to nine. Cool. They've been coming out. So quite quite late, do you reckon that's because of the heat? And I think, coming? yeah, due to the heat they yeah. are coming out a bit later on. Yeah. Um, same as us, you don't want to be out in this, do you? No, no. Um, so she's moving around. Um, you can just see the maze down there. Yeah. It's where they're also causing the damage, and that's where they're actually living at the moment. So they're just coming out of the maze, coming yeah. into the wheat? Coming up through, yeah. yeah. We yeah. stalk slowly up to the edge of a wood where there's a high seat. Tom and Ollie make themselves comfortable. But you know that thing about deer. They just don't do what you want, and not a single animal shows itself. As we walk off the hill, Tom spots a glimmer through the thermal. It's on the horizon, but it's livestock on a far hill. Dartmoor is big enough to play tricks on you like that. The next bright spot Tom sees actually is a deer. It's a roebuck. We um, spotted a roebuck chasing a doe yeah. down the bottom here on the edge of the wheat. Um, so we'll just creep down the fence line here using the dung as our cover. Yeah. Um, I've got the buds low in my pocket, so we'll... Um, Give it a few beeps and see if we can get that to come into the call. Yeah, you can see them jumping around over there. Yeah. Um, cool, that's really interesting. I've never, I've never, I've never actually never called a robot in before, so that'd be great. I mean, seeing that happen, it gives us um, yeah, but a bit of hope that it will work. Right. Yeah, right. took some stuff in there, didn't he? Well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> I enjoyed that. That was uh, he because he literally kept getting, he stopped there yeah. and then he stopped in front of the dung, started to move again. Then there's another pile of dung. All right, Tom. Yeah, they're very good. Yeah, happy with that. How's your leg? It's all right, actually. Yeah. It's really well, it was supposed to, it was it was supposed to be a stationary high seat, but we ended up actually doing <laughs> doing a bit more stalking than we. I think I'm ready for a job now. <laughs> yeah, that was. A, he was saying to me at the beginning, that was your first, that's your first real walk since surgery. Yeah, that's yeah. the longest walk I've had, yeah. yeah. They go and pick up the buck. A good, good one to shoot as well, look. Uh, so, looking second year, this one coming through. Um, you see a lot of people say these are murder bucks, but they're not murder bucks. So, second year, this one, um, young animal. So, as you can see, it is actually a good one to take because he hasn't got no times going at all. Um, so, yeah, very good car animal. Um, he was chasing that doe around a bit, um, so I don't know where the other bucks are. Um, but yeah, definitely a good car animal and uh, good shot. Yeah, so you can see, on the spot. So yeah, it's completely um, straight there, isn't it? Yeah, he's got no threat at all. So there's a little bit of something there, but you know, 
definitely a good animal to take out. Um, you don't really want that passing his genes on. So yeah, good job done in good timing. For more about Tom's guided stalking and his venison box service, find him on Facebook or Instagram, Dartmoor Deer Services. And you can go both game shooting and deer stalking with Ollie in Cornwall. Visit CornishSportingAgency.com. Thank you, Ollie and Tom. I really enjoyed that. Now, a quick shout out to Guns on Pegs, who kindly had me as a guest on their podcast. So if you are a glutton for punishment, you can listen to me on that too. Link in the description below. Next, news editor Ben O'Rourke is on the trail of people who commit crimes in the name of badgers. Shady characters walk through a field at night, climb over gates looking for shooters. This is one of the latest recruitment videos from anti-badger call groups. A masked woman tells viewers they should join us if they want to help the animals. Some of the activity in the video is illegal, including stealing traps. A key tactic of the antis is targeting people who are legally contracted by the government to kill the badgers. That's become a lot easier for them after the leak, apparently from a government department, of information about colours. Certainly from the first, um, the first lot of badger calls, the security of people's uh, data uh, personal information of those involved was uh, of paramount importance to everybody involved. You know, um, certainly with the number of threats uh, that was swirling around, and I was certainly really surprised to see the kind of information that uh, that um, the Innocent Badger website and Stop the Cull Online are able to put out about individuals who are involved. Ian Jensen is a former Metropolitan Police officer turned investigator who specialises in animal rights attacks. I suppose there's a possibility that somebody working w would be sympathetic to the colours, as we know many people are, um, uh, and so may have may have either been persuaded or felt it was their duty to pass that kind of information on. Field Sports News spoke to some of the people whose information, phone numbers, addresses, emails, has been leaked. Although unwilling to speak to us publicly, they were disturbed by the news especially when groups like Stop the Cull, which released the data, say they will find out what it's like to be hunted and chased. But a lot of people love badgers. You know, they're a, they're a lovely looking animal, but a lot of people don't understand the, the situation in the countryside and how it affects many farmers, particularly dairy farmers and, and beef farmers, and how badgers can spread TB. So I would imagine that people sympathetic are, are probably, uh, probably support in some way some of the actions of the badger groups, but I would imagine that the vast majority are either unaware or turn a blind eye to some of the more violent, scary, uh, some of the more over-the-top uh, tactics that, that they threaten to use. While threats on social media are common, Jensen says it's rare for animal rights extremists to carry them out. However, he says any threats should be reported to the police. A lot of people get threats on Facebook. I know Charlie and David do quite a lot. Um, and, and, and not all of them are followed through with. It's easy for people to do. And, it, and it's often just the modern way of shouting your displeasure in the street. But it shouldn't be taken lightly. And if you're involved in legal activity, especially one that's, that's sanctioned by the government, then there's no reason why you should have to put up with that kind of thing. Police are investigating. According to one of the victims, again speaking off the record, the case has been elevated. So the fact that it's gone to, to, uh, to a, a crime investigation unit makes me feel that, that it has been elevated and that, that there'll, be, um, a, there'll be a higher level of, um, of resources and experienced and skilled officers uh, looking into that. If it's come from a government organisation or, or, or an organisation of any size, you know, they're, 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 um, they're bound by the GDPR, which, which is the, the latest rules about people's personal data and the and the, um, the regulations they have to they have to conform to to make sure that that data is kept completely safe and secure. If you find yourself a target of this, you know if you know who holds your information, and it is in, in this case possibly Defra, possibly the NFU, then you can make a report to the Information Commissioner saying that you don't think your personal data has been kept secure enough, and um, and let them investigate that. If you want to contact Ian about the issues raised in this piece, please email ian at fieldsportschannel.tv.
Thank you, Ben, bunch of crazies. Now from muster lids to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Fair Game Pursuits put out its first red stag stalk of the season in this 45 minute film of a chat between two stalkers, Jim and Nick, with covering shots of the stalking and a large chunk of the film given over to a piece about butchery. Their enthusiasm shines through. A series of great stalks into Roebuck by Yacht Bureau Carla in this film, including one where they get to within 10 metres. The film in German shows off stalking in Poland, as does this film from Potterick 81 Hunting. These are clips from his August 2020 outings. Life as a hunting guide in New Zealand from this new channel, a Henarata hunting life takes out some guys to try to get them their first sandbar. Two of them succeed. Our Aussie buddy Rob Fickling is out hunting in New Zealand for Aimpoint in this film, Aimpoint Hunts the Globe 4, episode 6. He is after fallow deer and feral goats on North Island farmland using the Aimpoint Accuracy 1 and Aimpoint 3XC. Back to the UK and Airgun Hunter UK puts out Wraith Farmyard Rat Shoot, referring to his site mark Wraith, which sits atop his rat work tuned 177S200. Wash Wild Fowler East Coast is out pigeon shooting in this film. It's a series of shot cam clips over music. And finally, with the duck season soon to open in the UK, he has a new film about duck shooting last season in the USA. Widgeon in the Wheat from Grind Waterfowl TV is about a great first day in North Dakota. That's it for this week. I put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the iSymbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. That is it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, where you can click to like us on Facebook and on Instagram, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, and of course, pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you by email about this show. Field Sports Britain is out at 7 p.m. UK time every Wednesday, and this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye. Mm -hmm.